So good morning, everybody. Um, you've had a chance to speak with Sasha, but I'm gonna introduce her formally. She's a community early childhood education um, and family engagement consultant at the Jewish Education Project. Uh, her passion for Israel began when she was a preschool teacher at Temple Beth Shalom in Needham, Massachusetts. It continued to grow through her experience living in Israel in 2014, where she was working towards her master's in Jewish education at Hebrew Union College, Woohoo, my alma mater. As part of her study, she focused on her capstone on exploring early childhood educators, culminating in her paper, giving Hatikva to our children, how teachers in a Jewish early childhood program bring Israel to their school. She enjoys talking about how young children conceptualize Israel and exploring teachers teaching Israel and is thrilled to be joining us today. And you're in for a great, great um, session. Well, so without further ado, welcome, Sasha. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Um, I'm curious who teaches what. So if you teach this particular grade, raise your hand so I can just see who's in the room. Um, so who here teaches preschool? Great. Um, kindergarten? First grade? Second grade? Everyone? <laughs> okay. Um, over second grade. Okay, great. So we do really have quite a mix here. Um, my background is specifically in early childhood. And so most of the presentation has been projects that I've used in early childhood settings that I've adapted towards religious school. I've also spent a lot of time teaching second and third grade, um, particularly in the Boston area. Um, so if there are any ways that you think that this can be adapted in new ways, please share with the group. Um, we're going to also have a Google Doc at the end that everyone can kind of brainstorm a different ideas with, share their own contact information, and utilize it to continue to keep the conversation going and just have a place where those ideas get placed. Um, so I have a lot of information and not a little time, but I really do appreciate having all of your ideas and interactions being part of this. So if there's something that you want to share or reflection on an idea, please put it in the chat so that we can um, turn to it. Um, and I think, yeah, let's, let's get going. And also I know who here is teaching on Zoom and who here is teaching in person. Okay, so I knew that that would be, that both of those things would be part of the reality of what it's like to teach right now. So most of the ideas are um, translatable online, but I think also some of them were being creative in new ways, just like we've been for the past year. Um, but I'm excited to be able to share these with you. So for our time today, we're gonna start with how do young children think about Israel? Um, how do they conceptualize it? And let's, we're going to kind of discuss different frameworks for thinking about um, what we can do to lay the foundation for further thinking about Israel. Part of that is using the concept of same, same, but different. And how do we create modern day comparisons between our lives here in America and lives that children lead in Israel? Well, I have a lot of activities to share. And then we're going to go to our Google Doc for ongoing exploration and collaboration within this group. So Sivan Zakai is a um, really wonderful educator at HUC in LA and has done a lot of studies specifically from five years old through sixth grade, um, thinking about how young children think about Israel and how that um, how their concepts develop as their um, as they do. So this study, part of an ongoing longitudinal project, shows how five and six-year-old children are able to form a multi-layered conception of Israel, viewing it as both a Jewish state and a place for those who live there, a dangerous place and a safe haven for Jews, and a place that is at once special and ordinary. And I think the one that I really want us to focus on today is a place that's both special and ordinary. Um, in our last group, we talked about this idea of how we kind of create a Disney world out of Israel. It's so fun and it's so exciting and we go and we explore and um, it's really a beautiful, joyous experience. But also young children find joy in simple things. They find joy in going to the grocery store and seeing their neighbor and going to school. And like those things can part be both special and ordinary too, and can connect young children to the idea that Israel isn't just this fantastical land, but it's a place where people live. It's a place where Jewish people live. It's a place that Jew people who aren't Jewish live. Um, we kind of shared how um, in America we have Christmas off. And in Israel, they have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur off. 
And so even though we're Jewish and we live in America and we don't have school on Christmas, there might be people who aren't Jewish in Israel who don't have school in Rosh Hashanah. And kind of those kind of comparisons that can be really tangible can help children understand the idea of what it's like to live in Israel, for it to be a country where people exist and do the things that they do. Um, so we talk about Israel often in our classrooms at th three distinct times, um, kind of with the pinnacle of Yom Chatzmaut. Um, so something I like to talk about is that we teach Israel as if it is a holiday. We teach it right before Yom Chatzmaut. Then we have this big celebration. We have all the hummus and all like the sink and float activities. We put a note in the cardboard Western wall and then Israel's over. Um, and so how do we weave Israel throughout the year? And there's different times where it comes very naturally. It comes during the holidays, um, specifically Hanukkah, Tu B'Shavat, Passover, um, learning about Torah stories, um, and specifically in um, Genesis and Exodus, and then also modern day connections. If a child comes back from a trip for Israel or they're FaceTiming with their Israeli grandparents or cousins or one of uh, the teacher or someone in the school is going to Israel or comes back from a trip. And those are times when Israel gets discussed. Um, and we often discuss Israel in like a very unilateral way. And we know that young children really need to have hands-on approaches to everything. So remember that we need to connect when we learn to Israel to how we learn about Israel and being able to create those hands-on experiences. So if that's through language or arts or cooking, nature outdoor, also family engagement opportunities, particularly now that we're on Zoom and we can't have opportunities for whole families to be involved, how can we let families tell their stories um, about potential Israel experiences or what they know and use this as a time to educate not just the children. I think something that's really interesting is particularly with young children, this is the first generation of parents with young children who have had access to birthright. So even if many parents haven't had long-term Israel experiences, a lot of them have had short-term birthright experiences and how that's shaping how parents are talking to children about how they understand Israel. So I found that kindergartners understand in profound ways the concept of home. They understand that it's possible to have more than one home and it's possible to have shifting homes. So Israel as a Jewish homeland is a place where there's other people who live there and who have their home in Israel. Um, and so this idea is really tangible to kids, particularly kids have spent a lot of time in their homes lately. They, they know what homes have, they know who homes house. Um, and to be able to connect, make the connection from one home to another home can be a really powerful connection. Um, so this is a book I love. This book has nothing to do with Israel, um, but I just think it sets a really nice foundation. This is a boy in New York and a boy in India, and it's same, same, but different. And so I don't necessarily think you need to read this book to children, but I think that the concept lays the foundations of understanding different questions to ask to learn about children who may live somewhere other than where you live. And I also think it's important to remember that children in Israel don't have a unilateral experience of what childhood is like. Um, no matter where you live, they have their own unique experiences and all the children in your class have their own unique experiences as do children in other places in America. So to be able to use the same, same but different framework to explore the differences between children in your class too can help understand how even within your small place of where children live in the same community, that there are differences, that there are definitely differences in a different culture across the world, both between you and them and between them and each other. Um, and I think that those are things that children can relate to more when you ground it in what they know. So, and I think it creates a foundation for diversity, um, both within understanding their own diversity and diversity within Israel too. So I think the same, same, but different can be done from something as simple as how does one prepare an egg? <laughs> here's an omelet and here's shashuka. And they might never have seen shashuka before, but there's different ways to make eggs in different places. And you use different spices and you might use different cheeses. Um, here are two different ways of having a big breakfast. Um, and I have also used this PowerPoint with a picture of bacon in it. And I was told to remove the bacon picture, but I think it's actually interesting to think how you could have bacon in American breakfast, but you wouldn't have bacon in an Israeli breakfast because in a lot of restaurants, they keep kosher, so they don't serve bacon. So it's not even an option. Um, 
but I do think, and like, look at all these different meals, look at all the bread. Sometimes you have tuna, who eats tuna for breakfast in America? That's so silly. Um, and it's really ways to be able to connect to how would we make an Israeli breakfast here in America? Um, what do we need? Looking at the grocery store, I think is just also just in general, like a really fun thing to do when you travel. Um, but to be able to see what are the different logos, what are the different colors, we notice the Hebrew, um, sometimes you notice both script Hebrew and block Hebrew, and that can be confusing, but definitely uh, illuminates this idea for conversation. All of these are just provocations for children to explore, um, for them to ask questions and to be able to understand. Um, you can see like, here's like a cute little house on a hill. You can even wonder where in Israel do you think this is made? Like this doesn't look like Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, you only see things that are of sandy colors and tan, but this is a greenhouse on a hill. Where in Israel do you think they make this milk? Um, and so, yeah, so um, you can, so when we were just talking behind this and I actually, I don't, was it Lisa? Who, who did the matching game beforehand? Um, great. So there, if you could put that in the chat, um, something I love being able to do is to have a matching game either in person with laminated pictures or virtually where you can have the picture of the American milk with the picture of the Israeli milk and to be able to make those connections and use the context clues to be able to see the differences. So in the game session last um, round, I um, we learned of this new um, match match the memory. So thank you, Faith, for putting that in there, um, that you can create your own online match the memory, which this is also, again, grounding Israel in the everyday rather than in grounding it in the Disney and the extraordinary um, places. Another way that you could do this is using money. And in money, it also is just a really interesting invitation for questions. There's a menorah on the 10 shekel coin. Um, who are the people who the country chooses to put on the money? Who are they in America? Who are they in Israel? Why do you think they're chosen that way? The colors are different, even the size is different. What can we learn from a culture from understanding um, the money more? And you can use it for some sort of dramatic play if you wanted to create your own little grocery store. But you could also just use it as a framework for further exploration of understanding who are the different people who make up Israel's history. And I think that helps us understand this idea of Israel was not only in the Torah and now, but it has its own unique history, just like America has its own unique history that bridges throughout time. Um, and part of it is since 1948, but also part of it is previous to, um, and how talking about that history can then lay the foundation for later talking about more of what happened during those times. If we, lay, if we know that that history exists, that Israel wasn't only just now and then, but everything in between. So names we know are very important to young children. Um, it holds a sense of identity and connection to family. And not all children know their Hebrew names or know that their Hebrew names are names that other people might have in Israel or that connect them to their own family and to the family tradition. So maybe even look who in Israel might have the same name as some of the kids in your class and to see that there are people with this name that they are connected to. Um, learn a little bit about their own family tradition. Use the names in their class when you're trying to connect them to a modern day um, understanding of Israel. What does their name mean? Um, there, are, there are roots in our Hebrew language, and maybe you might not know what every name means, but you can look it up on the internet or ask someone in your community who might know. Um, and to understand that, that Hebrew is not just the language of prayer, but it's a modern language and names have meaning, that these aren't just words that have sounds. Um, okay, I want to stop here. Any questions, any thoughts right now? Okay, every, everyone doing well? <laughs> Great. So speaking of modern Hebrew, who raise your hand if you're familiar with Hebrew through movement. Okay, great. So Hebrew through movement is a curriculum that gets kids up and moving and hearing modern Hebrew. So la roots, everyone runs. La shevet, everyone sits. Um, and it also helps teach prayer. La hadlik ner, to light a candle. And for them to know that these aren't just sounds, but they're modern words that people are speaking. So trying to find ways to connect the modern language. Um, there's a lot of great videos out there. 
Um, this I have the link here to head, shoulders, knees, and toes, um, which is just like fun to be able to um, do with young kids when there are that they have the connection and the framework of what that song is in English. So they're able to follow along easily in Hebrew. Um, Shalom Sesame has a lot of different videos as well that are easy to share on a Zoom screen. Um, they do words of the day that you could adapt for your own words of the day. Um, oh, I love this idea of having someone go to a grocery store in Israel. I think that actually wouldn't be very hard to do if um, grocery stores are open and you know someone who is in Israel to go on a shopping experience. Um, and it might be actually really fun to be able to send a video back to a community in Israel too. Um, yeah, I'll, I, it is easy to find on YouTube, Lisa, but I can also make sure that you have it as well. Um, I also know that a lot of the, um, this information is on the Jewish Education Project website as well. So I'll make sure that you have access to that. So um, incorporating Israeli artists, um, I like being able to incorporate artists throughout time who are able to explore both Israeli culture, but also just like art in fun ways. And Hanukh Piven is an artist who really is very playful um, in ways that young children can understand and gravitate to. Um, he has a lot of books that are really fun, but really what he does is he uses found objects to be able to make portraits. So for children to be able to make portraits either of themselves or someone that they're learning about who might be Israeli, um, and to think, what are the symbols that make this person important, either me or someone else? And how do I incorporate that symbol in the art? Um, I think that it's a really great way if you're learning about someone um, to be able to think about what are the characteristics that make them, make them so that we're learning about them right now, um, but also just a way to connect oneself um, to things that make you special and to this Israeli artist. Um, Yaakov Agam is a, has beautiful Israeli artwork that is very kinesthetic, uh, kinetic, where you can see it in different ways and it moves. Um, there's a lot of online videos about how to make work like Yaakov Agam by creating an accordion, doing one colors on one side, one color is on the other side, um, a lot of interlinking circles. And Yaakov Agam also is an earlier set artist than Hanukh Piven. And lastly, oh, wrong direction, Mark Chagall and the windows um, in the Hadassah Hospital. What's really incredible about these windows is that there, there are just so many things that first of all, they're the 12 tribes, there's 12 different windows and they each are telling stories using symbols, but also these are windows that are actually in a hospital in Israel. And to think that they've created this prayer space that has to tell the Jewish story in a hospital so like we might not have that here in America and in a time where we're thinking about people who might be sick in our communities, how would we tell the story of our country or of our family in a way that brings comfort to others? I just think it's a really beautiful thing to think about. And each one of these windows is its own unique piece. So like you could have the 12 stories of the 12 families of the kids in your class and they each could make their own window and think of their own symbols of what makes their family special. Um, I love using watercolors and then outlining it in Sharpie. Like it doesn't have to be so complicated, but the piece that I think is really important is has how, what story are we telling and why? Um, and to be able to connect it to the, this piece, which is a public work of art in the Hadassah Hospital in Israel. Um, so the Eye Center really sh has a lot of information about these beautiful posters um, that every year in Israel, there's a contest of how do we represent what has happened this year through art for our public community. And so there's different posters from every year from 1948 on um, that just show different symbols and meanings of what has happened that year. And both this can be a way of like, what do you think has happened in Israel this year? How would you put that in a poster? But also what has happened in your life um, in a year? What are the symbols that you think are important and to relate it back to the poster and how might this year be different than years past or and to have them have a collection or to show what, what kind of different symbolism is using this kind of as an inspiration for doing that self-reflection. Um, look looking at the symbols of these posters, they're just like really beautiful visual texts. Um, fun with food. One of the things I love to do over Zoom is make hummus in a bag and to just put some chickpeas and some lemon juice um, 
maybe a little bit of seasoning and just squish. And I think that that's something that you can also do while teaching another lesson. Um, having that tactile sensory experience for young children is really helpful to help them focus while they're on Zoom. And then you have a lovely snack 20 minutes later. Um, also chocolate balls, creating choco bisakit, which is chocolate milk in the bag. You can do that with a little bit of extra duct tape and cutting the scissors, cutting the corner off of a, um, just a Ziploc bag. But these are a lot of very traditional Israeli foods. Um, but I also do encourage you to break out of the shell of what we think of as particular like Israeli foods and incorporating the other cultures that are influences in modern day Israeli culture and society. Um, there's some Arabic dishes, some um, Ethiopian dishes to be able to have. These are really part of the mass culture. And I think it's also really fun to be able to do this, particularly in family like family engagement programs of what kind of recipes can we find. Um, there's a lot of really famous Israeli artists, uh, chefs right now. Um, Yotam Olegeni is like one of the big ones um, to be able to see like what kind of influences we could do and to like create a very fancy, fun meal that is different from something like falafel and hummus all the time. Um, and it kind of gives you also an opening to be able to talk about the pluralism and diversity within Israel through using um, food as a lens that can teach the whole family. I love spices. I think it's really important for young kids in particular to be using all their senses and we often forget about smell. Um, we can even paint with spices, do spice identification. What does this smell like to you? Is there a food that the spice reminds you of? I'm showing them pictures of the shuk thinking about how you buy spices in America versus how you buy spices in the Shook. Um, it's a really different experience. Um, yeah. There's a lot of really great places to find photos. I think a really underutilized resource in our community is the Ministry of Tourism Photo Gallery. There's incredible, beautiful professional photos able to be downloaded for free off that website um, of all different nooks and crannies of the old city of beaches, of like rolling hills. They're just absolutely incredible photographs to be able to use to inspire. Um, also Israeli artist uh, Zion Ozari has um, a lot of portraits of people. And I think again, being able to go to the special and to the ordinary, that showing people who live their lives in ordinary ways and beautiful portraits helps show the diversity of Israel and age, race, ethnicity, religion. Um, they're all part of it and can, like, what does it mean for us to take a portrait of our family? Like, that can all be used as a framework for further exploration. Um, there's a lot of also wonderful YouTube videos of, like, just moments of modern life in Israel. This, this is one about Tel Aviv street food. There's also one that I love where it, someone must be wearing a webcam on their head while they bike through Tel Aviv. And it just shows the bike culture of the city. And you see the dogs and the juice guy and all these different things that like make you feel like you're part of the energy of Tel Aviv, which is just not always a story that we tell when we're talking about Israel as if it's a holiday for Yom Hatzma'ut. We don't see those everyday moments of biking down the street. Um, and what is it like for you to bike down the street, particularly if you're with kids who are five through eight, they're learning how to bike. And, and seeing that biking is part of a transportation and part of a culture, that's exciting to them because it's connecting them to what they know and appreciate. Um, lots of Shalom Sesame. These Shalom Sesame postcards have, they have like, this one is a minute and six seconds. Um, here, this is postcards from Gover from Daliat al Carmel, which is like not a common space that we often teach about. And yet here there are lots of different postcards from different cities. If we want to explore cities that also we personally might not know so much about, but are able to give a connection to to kids. Um, I also always appreciate the Kotel live stream as a way not just to see that the people are praying at the Kotel, but also to know that there's also, I, I've really very rarely seen it where that there's not a difference in light because usually what I'm, particularly if after school, religious school, if I'm showing it at four o'clock in the afternoon, then it's already dark in Israel. And that creates a, an invitation to be able to talk about the time change and how it's different for us than them, which I just think is a really exciting thing for children to begin to understand. And yeah, so that is the presentation. Um, I have a Zoom uh, Google Doc now for us to share together, which I'm going to put in the chat in a second. But I hope that there are some ideas there for you to take with you. Um, 
as we think more about how to teach Israel to our youngest learners. And there is, here's group two. Great. Um, any questions? Well, so the link is in the chat. Um, let's do a few minutes of just group brainstorming of things that you're thinking about. And I'm gonna actually add a thing for contact information at the bottom. So if any of you want to connect with each other um, afterwards about a program or something that you're thinking about, that you can. I am curious, what, what, what is something that you think that you might take into your classroom moving forward this spring? Can we talk and write at the same time? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Hi, okay, so I'm really stuck on this grocery store concept. And I understand that there are people that are on this group with us that are from Israel. And I would love to be able to see if they would possibly go into a grocery store and do, I teach kindergarten and first grade. I think it would be awesome. I, um, I'm trying to find out my sister-in-law has a relative in Israel and I'm trying to see if maybe I could get them to go in. But I think if they went in there and showed chips and, you know, the things that the kids eat would be so awesome. Um, I, I just love that idea. And then the other thing, seriously, you just take some, chickpeas, a little lemon juice, and smush them together in a baggie? More or less. You can put in some tahini, um, but based Idea. on what people have in their homes, they might not have all that much. Um, right. There are, I know PJ Library created a hummus in a bag video um, this past, I guess it was April, um, right. but it's not, it's not hard, and actually the less liquid you have in it, the harder it is to squish the chickpeas, which means that they're occupied with the fidget toy for longer <laughs> um, while you're engaging them in something else on um, a screen. I don't know about anybody else, but I struggle sometimes with, you know, asking too much of the parents to, I, I just, you know, I'm trying to figure out a way to just make sure that I have the kids entertained for the 40 minutes. Right. Also learn and um, uh, so, Thank you. I, you did a great job. Thank you very Thank much. You. Hi, Carrie. I want to add on to your, your question. Um, Who are you? Oh, okay. Hi. As far as getting um, somebody into the grocery store, sometimes it's a little bit difficult um, to match those connections. However, if you go on YouTube, you if you um, type in Israeli grocery store, okay. um, found about six or seven, well, more than that, um, <clears throat> dozens and dozens of, of Israeli okay. videos. Uh, of going into it. And you can kind of pick one that might suit, suit you. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Didn't even think to Google it. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. I can't hear you, but no. And I don't think you're on mute either. Do you want to just type your question in the chat? Can't hear you yet. Yeah, type it. Right, and I think, I hope that if someone does find a good YouTube video for going in a grocery store that you could add it to this Google Doc and then everyone could use it. That would be really helpful. Um, oh, you went to an ice cream shop to practice Hebrew. That's so fun. Uh, and I also think like the ice cream shop, that's not a place that I mentioned, but that's a place that like, Kids in America understand. And I think flavors are very different of ice cream in Israel. And the words that you use in Hebrew to describe the flavors that you might know here in America are different. Like to team, strawberries, it's a really funny word to kids. Um, and it, that could be a great way to make some of those connections as well. Yeah, I hope that if you do some of those art ideas um, that, you were able to share and um, explore a little bit there. I also, I realized 
I took a few of the artists out and I, I did not realize until this morning that I only shared male artists. There are a lot of female artists in Israel and I'm sorry that I did not include them in this presentation. They are in a longer one that I've shared before. Um, but I also recommend that you search female Israeli artists and find more. Um, also something if you have a little, if you have older kids, I've done like online graffiti tours of Tel Aviv, um, which is just a really cool way of engaging to understand how art can like incorporate cultural and social and political pieces in addition um, to just being art. And I think that oftentimes it's harder for our little ones, but if you find the right graffiti, um, it actually can be really exciting for them as well. I'd say it's particularly for like our first through third graders. Um, there's a lot of interesting symbols in that. And you, using art over Zoom is actually very easy for deep conversations and can be inspiring. Um, oh, is this a video for? It's a Rachel? link of a uh, image I took of uh, the street art in Tel Aviv when I was there for birthright. Oh, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that just really also wants to remind me to remember to share with you that any experience that we have as um, people who may have traveled or learned about Israel in our pasts, we are people who young children love. <laughs> and to be able to bring our own experiences and memories um, can really enrich how young children think about Israel as a place not that's long ago and far away, but a place that their teacher has experienced or their parents have experienced. So finding ways to uplift the stories of the community, um, whether or not they're personal or communal or family-based is a really wonderful way to remember to help young kids um, make the connections. Any other last questions? So the Google document first was for you to just share ideas that you're holding. Um, ideas maybe that you've done in the classroom, um, reflections on any of the things that you plan on doing. And if you find other things such as, um, Rachel, I don't know, could you put that link to photos? Um, I don't have a place in the Google Doc for photos, but why don't you add it and add that link to it? And then it can be captured and saved for future use. Thanks, Rachel. So I hope you have some things to take with you into your Israel education moving forward. Um, feel free to be in touch. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Um, the Jewish Education Project is basically the education wing of the Federation here in New York. We're sponsored by UJA. Um, and so we do a lot of different professional development on a variety of topics. And we have a portal that kind of holds our resources. So if you're interested in learning more about the work or to, I've done other webinars on Israel education and have other resources, you can even like make a profile and create your own library and save the things that are inter of interest to you to your own um, website, like to your own library. So I actually invite you all to play on that. Um, if that's something that interests you. I'll put our website there as well. But there are a lot of um, a very similar presentation as well as um, additional Israel resources are always available through the Jewish Education Project website. So it's a neat place to be able to check out. Sasha, we thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, before we leave, we'll ask you to tell us one thing that's different about New York than, 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 than um, Atlanta right now. Oh. Well, I think one thing that always is different is our lack of outdoor space. All our playgrounds are on the roof. Um, but right now, I think um, it's something that I've noticed, I was actually just in Boston this past week, and that despite the uh, that everyone is wearing masks and being very careful, and yet the city still has a vibrancy to it. And there's a lot of people, at, like the amount of people at a park on a given day is like a little, a lot, but it's still, there's a lot of dogs and a lot of people and a lot of time spending outside in the cold. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm putting back in the, in the chat, the link to the main room. Um, it's right there now and we'll join back together, but thank you so much. Have a great, great day and Shavua Tov. And um, we hope to see you again. Thank you all. Have a good day.